this hedge already needs cutting. Yay! <laughs> yip yip hooray, it's beanpole day. I always think this kind of moment of the beanpole is going up. It's, yes, the year is properly underway. The new, the new growing year has arrived. So, I've got two beds ready and I'm going to get four rows in, in total, two rows in each bed. Each row will have 12 bean poles, canes in, so that's, so that's 48 canes in total. Each cane will have two plants, hopefully, uh, so that's 96 bean plants, <coughs> climbing beans. Little bit less than in previous years when I've arranged the poles differently. Come on, go get on with it. Let's try and work out what the midpoint is. Then it may come out. So, Opla. I'm using eight foot bamboo canes. Oh, that's a prickly plant. Eight foot bamboo canes. About a foot will go into the ground, so I've got a seven foot out of the ground. Some of the beans will climb beyond seven foot. But when they get to about seven foot, I'll nip out the tops and that will encourage side growth for more beans from the sides. That's going to take a little while. Actually, what I'll do, what I normally do is I'll divvy out my poles, um, the number for each side, so that I'm not having to count all the time. And you know what, this, this might be easier for me to just sit down and talk about for a second because it's the kind of multitasking I don't think I can do because I want to just talk about the different ways to put poles up for any of you who are new to gardening. Um, I know that there's a load of you who are absolute experts and do not need any of this information. But yeah, let's have a sit and a chat for those who are new to this pole bean, climbing bean lark. Cracky, you know what? Just before we get into this, it's a really muggy day today. Um, I'm going to be glistening. When the clouds, you know, move out of the way, it's really bright sunshine, really warm. How fantastic. Look, I'm in a summer top. Yay, it's not even summer. But it's really, really humid um, as well. All that predicted rain, not happening. So the first thing I've done today on my visit is water the bits and pieces in the cold frame just a few starting to come up yay but also water the carrots water the cocoa de pampole because they're the only things that are direct sown by the end of today i hope i will also have beans in the ground so that's why i'm getting on with my structures so in terms of what support to use i'm using bamboo canes i think it's probably the go-to for virtually every grower in the uk uh, I'm sure in other parts of the world. Um, Cost-wise, I can't remember how much. Sorry, but in terms of longevity, folks say to me, "Why do you, why do you take your bean poles out each winter?" <laughs> My glasses are steaming up. I'm getting so hot. Yeah, why do I take them out each winter? It's to help them last longer, so that you can see you can see where that was in the soil last year. <laughs> There's the soil level. If I leave them in the soil over winter when we are generally pretty wet, um, they'll just rot, snap off in the soil. So yeah, I take them out just to help them last a bit longer. And also there's an element of crop rotation involved. Um, I don't necessarily want them in the same place each year, but primarily it's about looking after my um, bamboo canes, because they're not cheap. Uh, and we want to get sort of three, four, five years out of them. Whenever they do snap and become shorter, they get used as supports for other plants. And eventually, as you saw when I was saying the carrots, when they're really, really short, they just get used as row markers or even as little teeny tiny supports for my seedling peppers, for example. Okay, so that's bamboo. If you're really lucky or really rich, um, hazel. Hazel, um, what do you call them? branches, sticks, make fantastic supports. 
So if you know someone who's got a wood, if you know someone's going to be coppicing their hazel, is it hazel? I'm saying hazel and I'm suddenly thinking it's not hazel. Hazel coppicing, I'm sure. Anyway, yeah, great supports and I think longer lasting than bamboo, a bit thicker. They look beautiful in the garden and also because they are because they've got their bark on, a rougher texture. I think just in terms of making structures, they're a bit easier to work with because that texture gives them a bit of friction to hold against each other as you're constructing. I know that folk, it seems to be more popular in the States than in the UK, but the, the big sort of metal mesh panels where the mesh is, you know, sort of square holes, that sort of size, we really don't see that very much in the UK at all. But of course, without sort of poles or something, you know, anything vertical that you can get going vertical to train them up, brilliant. I have in the past here, years and years ago, I didn't have very many poles. So I'd made a support sort of either end and across the top. And then I used string coming down to a bottom pole. So all the string was under tension. Literally the next day a fox had come along and chewed <laughs> through every string, so I had to start again. Arr! So that didn't work very well for me. But yeah, anything strong, sturdy, that you can get upright for your beans to climb up. And the thing about the climbing beans is, so unlike say our squash and cucumbers and those plants which put out tendrils and the tendrils wrap themselves to cling on, uh, the beans cling on by winding around and around and around and around. So, so long as the, the structure is open enough or skinny enough for them to wrap around, they'll climb. They'll happily climb pretty much anything. Now, in terms of, you know, how to lay them out, I suppose there's three main ways. The one I'm going to do today is very traditional two rows so if if you're at the end of the row and I'm at one end so the rows going that way two rows so here are my bean poles and they're leaned in towards each other so that they cross at the top and then through that top bit at, at the top I can put another pole to brace and lash them all to to give it a bit of sideways sideways strength that's I think that's probably the way most people do it for me that's a really quick easy way well it's not that quick, but I think it's one of the quicker ways. The other way you could do it is, if we're looking down onto the soil, is to put a circle of poles in and draw them all together at the top, sort of teepee fashion. That's great if you've only got a really small bit of space. You can, you know, in a, in a, in a one square meter bed, you could probably, I don't know, cause I've never done it, but maybe 12, 14 poles into that area so yeah if you've only got a tiny space doing a tp may be your best option the the downside to both of those methods is where but particularly with the tp where all those structures are joining at the top you almost get a sort of bottleneck for your plants so where they're growing at the base you know they've got plenty of room plenty of light space air and as they converge at the top they become this mishmash and it just makes harvesting a bit trickier <laughs> You've got to go and rummage and i think yeah i think mainly it's about harvesting but i do think in terms of light and air around them it's a bit trickier to see if you've got pests in there such as black fly a bit trickier to get in there to deal with the black fly with your garlic spray or whatever it is however it is i think it is pretty much the easiest way of doing it either two rows like that or a teepee in theory what you could do with both those methods is find some way to keep them open at the top build some sort of frame around the top so that they're going up straight or even going out a bit you know if you're really clever you could do something like an old bicycle wheel or an old pram wheel if you were doing a the teepee style so you've got your you've got your poles in a circle and as they come up lashing them into some sort of wheel a wheel rim at the top that would keep it open 
get inventive. So that's that's like the two commonest ways. But what I started to do about, I don't know, four or five years ago, um, I started to do my beam poles as arches. So two poles either side and a pole lashed across, a shorter pole lashed across the top. And the reason for doing it that way was then I can put my poles, the, the where the top is, over my grass paths and it was a great thing to do because that means the, where the poles are into the ground they're in the very very ends of beds so either side the two beds either side I could put a completely different crop in it's a space saving thing so that then that path that wasted space between the two rows kind of wasted space doesn't matter I'm wasting it on my path so that worked out really well for me. Um, it meant that I had two whole extra beds. And I think the thing is, if you're trying to be self-sufficient in your food production and you've only got a half plot like I've got, every inch of space counts. So moving the beans to my paths rather than in beds was great. Increased production, brilliant. The only slight downside to that was it took <laughs> a lot more work way more string way more lashing to get the to get the bean arches made and put up it really was a pain in the backside each year it would take all day <laughs> because once all the arches are up they then need to have flying buttresses and crossways supports just so they've got sturdiness in all different directions because i am really windy here so yeah that's your um i think i'm talking too much now so i'm going to shut up but that's your main ways of, of putting beans up either long rows crossing at the top uh, a circle gathered together at top a la tp or if you can make your own arches down a pathway so as you you're walking underneath them on your paths you're not wasting any soil space you could of course if you've got the money and you're happy to spend it in your garden because it's beautiful and decorative you could of course buy metal arches pre-made arches if you want to do that or whopping aeroplane or like I said those sort of metal mesh panels that uh, that all my friends in America seem to use but we just don't see them here you know I could go to any garden centre near me oh happy holidays um yeah any garden centre near me and I would not see those metal mesh panels anywhere right that's enough chat I'm gonna st make a start because there's yeah, get all the poles and all the lashing. It's going to be a long day. of spacing I've got them about 20 centimeters apart um, I've already done these ones got halfway <laughs> I'm happy carry on and then they're in fairly lightly initially so that one I can move a bit and then when I'm happy <laughs> when I'm happy with the spacing and the angle they're at just get them firmer in firmer in more firmly firmer anyway yeah in and oh yes the other thing to mention in terms of the bed prep here as mentioning the other day I'd weeded it got all the old plant matter out and I was hoping that I could avoid like digging digging tried a couple of poles in they really didn't want to go hang on I'm going to come round to this side uh, and start getting this side of poles in this side is easier because that side is done it's all my measurements yes I tried a pole in the ground and yeah I couldn't get it in <laughs> it was like rock uh, so the whole bed and also the, uh, there was loads of the horse muck just sitting on the top still so I sort of well dig is dig the right word it wasn't really like like I used to do in the old days you know a full forks depth down every inch kind of 
lifted out, turned over, bashed. It wasn't like that. It was more just sort of putting the fork in and flicking, well, flicking, sort of levering a little bit just to get it a bit opened. Um, and by way of doing that, also that, that sort of slightly turned the horse muck in, what the, the remnants of it. Top couple of inches were okay, obviously, from, from the horse muck. But anyway, so it's had a bit of a tickle. It hasn't had any, um, any sort of manure or fertiliser because it had the, the horse manure on from last year. I hope that's enough. The other bed over behind me and nearer to the rose bush is one along from where I put the carrots in the other day. That I did add chicken pellets to because it's had nothing um, on it since last year. The other thing you can do with your beans, and again it's something I've done in the past, is Let's say we get to the end of the previous year. Let's say we're going back to last October, November or so. And I've already sort of done my plan for this year. So I know exactly where I want to have my beans the following year. What you can do is where you're going to have the beans. So say it was this bed last November, what I could have done is dug two trenches where these poles are now sitting. And then over the course of the winter and the early spring, fill those trenches with all my kitchen scraps, old bits of newspaper made soggy, bits of soggy cardboard, basically all that organic composty matter, just chuck them in the trenches. Partly, there's two reasons for that. One, all that matter, it's, it helps retain water, especially if, you're, if your ground is prone to you know, just, what's the word for it? Draining really, really quickly. It helps to retain water. It's some nice organic matter. I have to go down the other end now. Nice organic matter for your beans. And bear in mind that beans are really greedy, really greedy feeders. So, um, so yeah, if for next year, if you didn't do it for this year, when you get to the end of this October, November, and you're clearing your garden, putting everything away, Think about where you want to have your beans next year and have a little think about that, uh, making those trenches. And it's a great way of getting rid of all the, all the sort of, the, as you're clearing your garden at, in the late autumn, all that matter that you're chopping up, chopping up, just chuck it in your trenches. They act like a bin, <laughs> a bin for the winter. And your beans should, thank you. <laughs> And of course, that ground later on will thank you because it will all just become a bit easier, a bit more friable, a bit more organic. Yay! Oh, it's getting hot. So, I think it's, it, hopefully it's... I can hardly see you because of the sun. Hopefully it's kind of obvious. The next step will be, I'm going to do my, my cross ones at the top inside the V, put poles in, lash all of that together, and I'll do a couple of crossways in the rows, a couple of poles crossways lashed in to give it support there. And then I'm done and I'm ready to start sewing. But that's the bit that takes a while. It's all the strings and the lashing. So join me in a few well a few minutes a lot of a lot of minutes and we'll talk about beans for the year i think i need to get a bit of a wriggle on look at the sky oh my goodness it's gone quite overcast Opla. Yeah, it's gone quite overcast and it's suddenly, the temperature's dropped. Oh my goodness, it's weird, changeable weather. And that piece of string, <laughs> that wasn't quite long enough. I'll just make sure that the next one uh, is longer is tighter.
But goodness me, isn't, isn't this, hold on a sec. Oh, falling backwards. Isn't this the image of allotment gardening? <laughs> Getting the bean poles up. In previous years that's um that's an indicator that I need to get a wriggle on <laughs> when I have oh when friends and neighbors appear who are generally afternoon types <laughs> taking too long come on Vivi well I've just taken my cardigan off again as well because I don't know, it's just weird weather, it's muggy. Anyway, you might, if you are a little shorter than I am, you might need to stand on something to do this bit or go and speak nicely to a tall friend. But it's one of those jobs that like it feels like it takes forever because the blood disappears from your arms. <laughs> the function, oh my goodness, noise now as well. Right, let me get on with this and we'll catch up when it's all done, hopefully. Time for some sitting down jobs before I tackle the next set of bamboo poles um yeah it's like tying the string up in the air it <laughs> just when the blood comes out of your arms never mind done that first set's done i'll do the second set in a, in a moment um yeah sorry about that brief cut interruption <laughs> one of my pot neighbors was coming down the path and i thought the camera was in her way so i went to get out of the way it wasn't in the way and anyway sitting down moment i'm going to do my I'm just having a bit of a sort through the beans that I want to sow. Plus, I've also today sown... Hang on, because the lids don't fit very well. I've sown all my tender stuff now. So that is, for example, this is all types of squash, winter squash. There are two trays. This is a mixed tray, and then I've got a tray just of butternuts. So that's oh, 30 squash plants which should be too many. I'm just having to think about it now. Four and three, seven beds, four per bed, 28. It's only just enough. Now, um, they're gonna go in the cold frame. I was gonna put the prop, it, pop, pop, pop them in the propagators, but let me see if I can pick it up to show you. The, <laughs> yeah, you see where the, module sits in the tray the propagator lid is made to fit on the tray but not on onto the modules can you see so oh let me put it down it's really heavy compost is heavy it um it's just going to sort of sit on the top it's a little bit of protection um so yes squash done today courgettes cucumbers some more tomatoes the ones at home are coming along great it's really late to be sowing things. Um, I, I think this is the latest I've been sowing things. I have to check my records. However, I'm sure there's tons of aeroplanes today. It's doing my blimmin' nut. They've changed the flight path or something, I don't know. Anyway, in the past, there have been times when, you know, I've sown a load of squash or courgettes or whatever, and then the whole lot get munched, and so I sow again. And I think when I've done those repeat sowings to rescue, I think it's been about this time. So I think I might be okay. Um, where are we? We're the, I think it's the 17th of May today. We'll see. And put it this way, I think it will be... I, my attitude with the garden this year is hopefully I can get some good food out of it. But if not, I'm not going to cry over spilt milk. It will be interesting if sowing things this late and having done no work in the garden through January, February, March, April, 
if I end up with as good a harvest as ever, then I could say to myself for future years, I don't need to start till May. Of course, every year is different because the weather is different every year. Um, and also, I, I shouldn't be in this garden next year. Gosh, if I'm in this garden next year, something's gone wrong. But anyway, it will be interesting to see. I'm interested to see. And hopefully as well, I know that there's quite a few of you who feel like you're really, really late this year. So we're doing it together. Let's see what happens. Fingers crossed. Now, uh, I was mentioning the other day about seed saving, or am I mentioning it in a different video that you haven't seen yet? <laughs> I've lost track. Last year, I think, um, basically because I decided I'm going to have to give up the plot, can't do this anymore, it's ridiculous. I think I just turned my seed saving mind off. So I don't have any cocoa Sophie seeds, at least I don't think so. I've got a pot of seeds that could be either Coco de Pampol or Coco Sophie. They're not labelled. How stupid of me. It's the only pot with no label. So, I don't know. I might sow a couple just to see what happens and then I can, at least I can label that pot for next year. So what I have got and that I am going to sow is, this is all, this is mostly seed from 2021 it's just the very last handful that's my gigantis I will hopefully get a whole row of them and I've got the fabulous and prolific Madeira maroon this is a great bean you can eat the bean green and wet as it were or leave them on the pods to dry and have the dry beans reconstituted then I've got a lovely helder, which is the only bean I'll be growing this year to eat the whole pod. So I'll have that as a whole, you know, green bean. Then I've got, because I've got loads anyway, this is all saved seed. Um, I've got a load of bog standard runner beans. But again, I grow runners not for the whole pod. Ugh, too rough and gnarly. Um, I grow them for the beans inside. Take the beans out when they're still green and wet. Um, freeze them brilliant to add to all my favorite dishes over the winter soups stews curries da 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 all of that i use them you know where you might use a tin of kidney beans i use my oversized runner beans and then finally oh look at the color on they're gorgeous this is the black churchill churchill black i have four seeds given to me not last year the year before trying to remember from those four seeds I ate from three of the plants and one of the plants I used purely for seed saving grew them on again last year remembered at the last minute lastminute.com to save some seeds so good I know what I'm sowing um, I don't know how far each one will go but I'm going to do my labels now anyway because yeah just to remember what I've got where once the beans come up, once the actual pods start to form, I'll know exactly what the bean is by the pod. But when the, the plants first get going and it's just leaf and stem, and no flowers, I won't have a clue. They'll all look the same. So I will do my labels and um, I've managed to find, very faded now, last year's Helder label. So I will reuse it. I'm going to be reusing, reusing all my pebbles. But I haven't, to be honest, I feel a bit, <laughs> I feel I'm a bit in a rush today now because there's been a lot of sewing going on, a, a bit of sorting and what have you, and there's not a lot of time left. So just grabbed all my other pebbles. I think that one wanted to be cocoa something. I can see the sea. They've all faded. I'll go over them now. Yay! I use my little rocks as labels and like I said you know once my once all my plants are up I kind of I know what everything is once it's up and away but in the in the initial stages I forget what they are I can't identify them when they're just teeny tiny little seedlings so yeah I do label things and the reason I use the pebbles I mean it's such a gorgeous idea isn't it another plane I stole this idea from the beautiful gorgeous Gertrude Jekyll garden on 
Lindisfarne, the holy island of Lindisfarne. It's, I mean, it's a bleak, bleak setting out in the North Sea. When I visited it, the wind was howling. It's, yeah, it's, it feels like a really bleak place. And then up on the sort of top of the hill, it's a, it's a walled garden, four walls on, on, on all four sides. The walls aren't terribly high, maybe, I don't know, four or five feet tall. But as you go through the gate into this garden, oh, it's a different world, it's a different world. Suddenly there's that little bit of protection from the walls. But even so, it feels like a really wild place. My romantic imagination went all over the place when I went to that garden. Anyway. And that's what they had. They had pebbles as labels. How perfect. They're an island. It's a little island. The beach <laughs> right there is all pebbles. So I thought, yeah, I mean, it's a, I think they're beautiful. They're pretty. They're lovely. What have you. But the big thing is, of course, the foxes don't chew them and run away with them. So in the past, whatever, I've used all sorts of different labels in the past, you know, bits of wood, bits of, you know, lolly sticks, bigger bits of wood, whatever it is, when it's sticks or, I did one year I had bits of bean pole that were broken but I made a slit in the top and slotted in um, a label in that. The foxes just have the lot out, chew them, <laughs> send them flying everywhere, so I'm back to that thing of, oh! What's in this row? <laughs> Can't remember. Um, and especially say with the squash when I'm growing quite a few different types. Uh, yeah, I need my labels. Brilliant. So I'm gonna get on with this and then, actually just while we're sat here chatting rather than, because I think it's gonna take me ages to get that next lot of poles up. And I don't know, I've got, f this weather. So the forecast was supposed to be this two weeks of solid rain that's changed on my way down here this morning um gary tooted me he was in his car we had a bit of a chat he pulled in we had a bit of a chat and he was saying how the forecast is now for three weeks of dry just seen a really beautiful spider um three weeks of dry <sighs> no rain just when we need rain now to be watering our beds that are seeded anyway lost my train of thought yes it's going to take me ages to get around to actually planting but when I do when I come to sow my seeds I'm just going to use my tent stick dibber actually what I'm going to do I'll probably do it now is I'm going to go and water the beds now quite a lot of water because they're really dry that water will have a chance to soak in whilst I'm getting well while I'm getting the second lot of poles up by the time I've done all that, the ground will be yeah be nice and soaked. Get the seeds in and give it another watering. The water will go in better second time around because that initial water will have soaked in. But just to say, so all I will do is dip a hole, chuck a seed in, dip a hole, chuck a seed in. For each pole, I essentially, ideally, I mean, I'd like two plants. So you know the old adage. Um, what is it? One for the farmer, one for the crow, one to get eaten and one to grow. Is that the old rhyme? One for the farmer, one for the crow, one to get eaten and one to grow. So around each pole, ideally I'd put four seeds because I want two plants. One for the farmer, one for the crow, one for the farmer, one for the crow. I don't think I've got enough gigantes to do that, but with all the others, yes, that's what I'll do. I'll do two seeds either side of the pole, and hopefully from that I'll get one either side. I will also do a handful as backups in pots, because if we do suddenly start to get a bit of rain and all the slugs come out, that's their favourite place to chomp. Okay, good. Yay! Uh, Getting on, getting back to things, cracking on. I mean, you know, look, I hope it's not all too late. I remain optimistic. I remain determined. So, yeah, a bit of that, a lot of that, and a lot of work in the next couple of days to really, really, really push the garden on to make sure everything that needs sowing is sown. Then I can relax a little bit and just then concentrate on... Um, bed prep for everything that's in modules ah also just to say in terms of the beetroot spinach lettuce all that stuff that i sewed in modules 
first, first, first little showings are happening. Woohoo! I need to get back to work. Right, cracking on. Gosh, it's getting really dark outside. We definitely didn't have any rain forecast today, but it definitely feels like we're going to get some. Well, it definitely feels like it, but I'm kind of doubting it anyway. Doesn't matter. I realise I've yapped on quite a bit today, and I know that I'm preaching to the converted in many ways. But, uh, like I said, hopefully in terms of support structures, spacing, feeding, etc, etc, I hope that was useful to at least one or two of you. <laughs> For now though, <clears throat> I'm going to call it a day. Um, really glad to get that done, that's another two beds sewn, so that's four beds sewn and in terms of direct sewing there's only going to be another couple of beds for direct sewing, otherwise everything is now sewn in terms of pots and modules, yay! <laughs> so all I have to do now is make sure I keep watering them um, because it is, we're now warm enough that they will dry out most days, so yes, good, 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 good. Um, feeling sort of almost back on track definitely feeling better for getting all those blooming poles up and tied in today yay so for now i'm going to say cheerio i hope i will see you again i will see you again quite soon because the last of the direct sewing is going to happen within the next couple of days or so i'll bring you along for that because it's the calendula and when i do it I'm going to construct my little wattle fences again because they worked a treat last year. But when I did them last year, if you remember, the plants were already really bushy and flopping everywhere. So it's really hard to see what I'd done by way of making these little fences. Again, it's absolutely ridiculously simple, idiot proof. I'm sure loads of you do it already. But I know from last year, a lot of folk were saying, how did you do them? I need to do that in my garden too. So... Hopefully, yeah, let's plan to do that in the next uh, next video, next time we meet up. So, until then, happy gardening, happy outdoor time if you're getting it, happy times, full stop. Cheerio.